Welcome everybody. My name is Anya Lehmann, Innovation Director here at Ascender. Uh, if you, this is not your first time here at Ascender, welcome, uh, welcome back. If this is your first time, you know, we, we want to say thank you for being here. Ascender is Pittsburgh's community for entrepreneurs. We offer educational programs, mentorship, expert coaching, business incubation, and a collaborative workspace located in Pittsburgh. You can find all of, all of this information and more in our website. So make sure that um, if you don't know about us, that you take some time, allocate some time to, to really browse through our website to, to get to know us a little bit better. Before we get started, I want to give a couple of announcements. Uh, later this month, we'll have another community event. This is a real tag talk with founders and it will return on Tuesday, April 27th. Uh, during this real talk, we'll hear firsthand from tried and tested founders who have pitched their business ideas countless of times before uh, and persevere. We'll have, we're really happy to have George Cook from Honeycomb Credit and also Gabriela Estris. Um, and they both have had uh, countless of experience pitching and they can really share from first hand, uh, you know, their victories, their hiccups and pitch nightmares. So this will be a really great opportunity to really get, um, you know, um, insights from people who have done it countless of times. So make sure that, that, you, uh, that you sign up for this event. After the event, we are providing personalized one-on-one -on -one, uh, feedback sessions. So if you are working on a pitch, whether this is you know, to recruit a new member or for an investor or for any kind of pitch, you are welcome to sign up for a one-on-one -on -one session with our team. And uh, so we'll stay behind after the event. This, this part of the program is, um, um, is limited. So make sure that you, uh, that you sign up early so that you can get a spot if you are interested in this kind of service after the event. Um, so if you have any questions, you know, feel free to also ask us in the chat box about this event. Uh, I am very excited to introduce our speaker today uh, and is our very own Executive Director, Nadili Nunez. Nadili has had years of experience evaluating startup pitches. For example, over the past two years, she has been part of the advisory board for South by Southwest pitch competition, part of the South by Southwest festival and also has participated in Inventure Startup Pitch, both of which focus on showcasing innovation, innovations worldwide and connecting them to expert talent and investors. Before her time at Ascender, Nadili was the director of Uprise BNY Mellon Social Innovation Challenge, which is a local challenge competition here in Pittsburgh. Due to, many, uh, due to this, in, this engagement and many more, Nadili has directly evaluated over a thousand product and business ideas from around the globe related to technology, smart cities, retail, the future of work, education, and more. So I leave you in very good hands and uh, so I'll pass it on to Nadili to get us started. Thank you, Anya. Welcome, welcome everyone. So I have a confession. This usually takes me two hours to go through because pitching is an art. It is difficult and there are a lot of details. So I'm gonna try my very best to fit this as much as I can in one hour. And maybe if we get enough requests, maybe we'll do like a two hour fun, you know, let's, let's really dive into to pitching. So thanks for those who answered the Mentimeter. Uh, you know, what's the goal of pitching? I see, talk about your business, discuss your vision, what you need to get out there communicate your business, uh, what you hope to achieve. And then it's just that storytelling is what we're hearing, right? A storytelling about your business. All right, so I'm gonna share my presentation, my full presentation, let's see. Oh, we got some more in there as well. Zoom. Also, I'm gonna, follow up in the follow up email, there's a great YouTube video on how to present via Zoom, you know, get, get your speaker view and your actual presentation um, to work, which for right now is not working. Can you see my screen now? I did a test run. Let's see. <laughs> Mm 
we'll do this. You see the cat on my screen? All right, great. All right, so now you see my presentation. Wonderful. Oh, right, so let's get started. Um, one is, well, welcome to pitching. And like Anya said, I'm gonna go real, really fast uh, just because I wanna fit so much, but I'm gonna try my best to be as clear as possible. We will likely do a recap. Can you confirm that then or Anya? We'll do a recap of this, uh, just high level things uh, in case, and especially at anything that I didn't get to. So there you go. You know, I'm the executive director of a center. Uh, uh, these are some of the places I've worked at. I graduated from Carnegie Mellon. That's what brought me to Pittsburgh. Uh, and I worked for Reed Smith, the global law firm for a global uh, business software deployment. I worked for a health insurance company, Capital Blue Cross, and then I started getting really into entrepreneurship with Upprise and, and seeing hundreds of uh, different applicants and business ideas. As Anya said, I've reviewed directly over a thousand businesses, ideas and pitches, but indirectly just attending pitches have been a lot more. All right, so we all know it. After you've given a presentation, this is how you feel, right? You blew it. That was really, really hard. What just happened? Okay, and that is totally normal because in reality, pitch perfection it is a long journey. I've seen people from the very start deliver a pitch and even two years down the road, it looks better, but they still have some more progress to make. So it's gonna take some time. But also pitch perfection, that's fake news, okay? Because no one is ever fully satisfied with your presentation because everyone is looking for something different, has a different style. All you can do is what makes sense for you uh, and, and um, makes sense to, to, for most of the people. And we're gonna get a little bit into what that looks like. Um, all right, so what's the point of pitching? Some of you already answered, right? You're doing some storytelling to talk about your business. I don't think it's about talking about your business, right? The pitching is a means to an end, right? So your resume is to get the interview. It's not to get the job. It's to get that next conversation that can bring you capital, that can bring you an introduction, that can bring you talent. Uh, so it's a means to an end. And it's important for you to absorb that because what that means is that you don't have to lay it all out in your pitch. You want just enough where someone wants to learn more, okay? So you need to have a pitch for every occasion, okay? Think about when you go out to a museum, when you go out to a party, when you go out to meet, you know, the parents, whatever it is, you need a pitch for every occasion. And so um, here's kind of what it looks like, right? For every audience and for every duration, you, know, you need one for your customer, you need one from your pitch competition for venture capitalism talent. You need one that's one to two minutes, five minute, 10 minute, 20 minute, okay? Now, before I get into a little bit more, I do wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the difference between these four on the left. Entrepreneurs time and time again, make the mistake of giving the same presentation to all these four people and that's not it, okay? So for the customer, they want to know how are you going to save them time, money, increase efficiency, or eliminate a problem that they have. And it's not something that you answer at the very end of your presentation. A lot of entrepreneurs I see, especially because they're building their product, that's their baby, they spend 99% of their presentation talking about the specs of the product and how cool it is or what. And even the business. Model. First, I want to know how am I going to benefit? from this. And once I know this is worth my time, I'm listening. Pitch competitions, they're trying to answer more, is this idea compelling? Is it unique? And is it sustainable? Specifically, I wrote down here uh, for South by Southwest, when we were reading applications, they gave us this criteria. And I think these are really great criteria to, to create your pitches around, especially from the perspective of the judge. So one, is this creative? So is your idea original? Is it unique? Two, does it have potential? Can it actually actualize? Can it be profitable? Three, is it good? You know, how will it impact the world uh, in a good way, in a bad way, in a, in a big way? Four, traction. 
uh, in terms of sales, how much have you gotten done? If you haven't sold anything, have you had a pilot? Have you talked to people? So what kind of traction you've made? So that's usually a question people who you're giving this presentation to, particularly when it comes to pitch competitions are wondering. And then lastly, the people. I've seen great ideas built by not a great team. Okay, and it works. You can make that, you know, you can make that happen at the beginning, but when it turns into a business, you need the right team for that. In fact, some investors will want you to fail fast because you have a bad idea, but they see that you are a great entrepreneur. Uh, oh, you're in slide for your audience, my bad. Are you in the right slide, Anya? Uh, this is for every audience, it says. Yeah, yep, that's fine, that's fine, yep. Thank you. So, and then, so that's for pitch competitions. And then for venture capitalists, Let's, let's just let's just be honest here, okay? They want a return on their investment. And again, entrepreneurs spend a lot of time talking about the product. What the investor wants to know is particularly if they're a VC, they wanna know if they're gonna make a 30 to 50%, um, if the rate of return is gonna be between 30 to 50% uh, of their investment in less than seven years. Uh, with angel investors, there's some greater leeway in that. And also every VC and every angel investor can be different, but just generally, that might be the, the spectrum. And then lastly, for talent, when you're giving a presentation, you're answering, can this, you're trying to convince them, can they work with this team? Can they get along with this other team? And will they be valued? Which is could be from a salary perspective, from an input um, decision-making perspective. So all of these folks in the audience, they, they all are interested in different things. And if you want to be successful in pitching, you need to adjust your presentation to meet what they want. Okay. For duration, I already mentioned that, but I just spent a lot of time in this, right? There's a lot. That's a lot of audience, a lot of duration. And frankly, no one has time for this. Okay. And so instead, we're going to focus on one type, which I think is a good starting point for folks. And maybe I'm biased because I've been doing a lot of pitch competitions, but it's the pitch competition. Um, so the pitch competition and a five minute, sometimes pitch competitions can be 10, but five is a good one because if you can do a five minute presentation, you've gotten to the core of who you are and your business and convincing that you can always add details to it. And then you can also have a place to start for that one to two minute pitch. So that's where we're going to start today. All right. Uh, next. So this is how I usually break down the pitch structure. You have the opener. You have your show and tell, your business, and your close. And then lastly, the appendix. You don't show the appendix unless someone asks a question that makes sense to show. So really, it's the first four. The opener is getting people's attention. Show and tell is exactly that. It's like a demo. What are you actually, what do you do? What is it? The business is how it's sustainable. And then close is that final part. But these four sections aren't weighted the same. They're weighted differently and how much time you spend on them is differently. So my rule of thumb is depending on whatever time, five, 10, 20 minutes, you spend 15% of the time on the opener, maybe even less, 50%. So the major, technically the majority show and tell, 25% in the business and close on the 10%. Uh, this moves around. If you see enough pitches, you'll see that it all looks differently and it, it depends on what you're producing, but this is just a good place to start. So for a five minute pitch, this is what kind of it looks like. Opener, 30 seconds, which isn't much, but if you have it down, great, you're good. Some people maybe take up to 40. Show and tell maybe two to three minutes, a business section, 30 seconds to one minute and the close 30 seconds. I looked at, uh, South by had about, I want to say 10 categories of pitches from health to AI. And I looked up at all the winners of the pitch competition and looked how and checked out how long their decks were. And on average, they were about 10. The most was 16. It was from eight to 16 slides. So I would say if you're doing a five minute pitch, try to keep it under 10 slides if possible. It depends how fast you're going, but this is just kind of a good reference point. There have been people who give presentations, five minute presentations without any slides. So if you're that good, do it, okay? 
All right. This, the reason I added the value proposition here is because the way you um, order some of the information within these four sections depends on what your value proposition is and how far you've come along. So, you know, is the exciting part about your product that it's very new, no one's done it before? Is it that it's customizable? Is it that the price is that, you know, that you can do it in the cheapest way possible? Is it that it's more convenient for people? So figure out what your value proposition is and that will also help you determine how you speak throughout the whole presentation about your product and what you want to highlight and what you want people to take away with. You want them to be able to say, oh, this product has, you know, just gets the job done. Okay. All right. So what does that look like with actual pitch content? This is sort of a nice breakdown. If you want, you can create a slide for each of these uh, lines, title slide, problem, solution, traction, market, business model, team, use of funds or timeline, and then lastly, the ask or a tagline. So feel free to just, you can even start there. All right. Uh, so we're going to start with um, the opener. So the opener is a title slide and the problem. And like I said, the opener is where you need to catch someone's attention. Okay. It's, it matters. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, it matters. So for example, we've got the natural nipple. This is a woman that presented last week. I was judging a pitch competition. She, I think is out of Toronto, Toronto maybe. And she's created a product that um, essentially creates a 3D model of of the person or a mother's nipple to better create a, a, a bottle that can feed a child for longer term. So there's a huge latching problem. I won't get into it. The point is, this was her title slide. This is a good title slide. Why? It has the logo name. It has some kind of image. Some people use a stock photo. And there's a line. But it's just quick. Seamless, stress-free, bottle, seamless, stress-free, bottle, and breastfeeding. So remember, we talked about value proposition. She's already bringing it up from the top, right? Seamless and stress-free and what it is, bottle and breastfeeding. She decided to include her contact information up here. You usually don't spend too much time on the first slide. So you may or may not want to include it. You definitely want to include it at the end. If you have a logo, have it here. Uh, and I think she opened it up with, how many of you love sleep? Now imagine it being interrupted by a screaming baby because this is nothing like a real nipple and she pulls up a bottle. So once you have your title slide, you, you just got started, okay? So you need people to pay attention. What are you gonna do to help them pay attention? Some of you are on your phones, right? Maybe I need to do a better job on helping you, you know, pay attention. Some of you are really, you know, into it. So here we are. So how do you do that? And how do you do that look differently for, for every person? And this is kind of what I suggest people do, right? When you first, first you start out with the problem and you talk about it from the perspective of one of these, is it that this problem is a huge problem. It's costing um, you know, a company or a market or whatever, millions and billions, trillions of dollars, whatever it might be, usually it's in the billions. Or is the process so inefficient that it usually costs money? Is it an unjust, a social justice cause? Um, or is the problem just like, it's just big, everyone has it, everyone has this issue, um, millions and billions of people have this experience. And so you want to give a, a perspective of where you're coming from and which your whole solution is based out of. So for the natural nipple, she started off with current bottles are the number one barrier of breastfeeding. And she says, you know, they cause nipple confusion direct uh, breastfeeding can take longer and it can be more painful. Mothers are tired and give up and baby mother immune exchange fails. But then she adds, we could save by prolonging breastfeeding rates to six months, we can save 1 million lives of babies. Now she could have said a million babies die every uh, under the age of five die because of you know the lack of um, breastfeeding or the continued breastfeeding. But she decided to do it in this section. So you got to decide what works for you. But you want to come with a strong number because ultimately what you're trying to answer or is in this section to catch someone's attention is why this, why now, why you? And you can't fit it all in the opener. You only got 30 seconds, remember? So you pick one that is most compelling as it relates to your product. 
for her, it was that there are a million babies who die under the age of five um, or that we could save them if we prolonged breastfeeding. And the other part there she added was, is the $157 billion market. So drop the mic. It's huge, right? And so she, she opened up in that way and that's what you wanna do too. And you have to decide, is it your market? Is it that um, you have a great team of experts that are part of hospitals and, and Johnson and Johnson, whatever. Some people bring up the team from the very beginning because that's the selling point. What is your selling point? Why is it you, right? Why, why is it this? Why is it now? Why is it you one of them? This is why now, right? Trend, it's, it's growing. It's a market opportunity. All right. So the next one is the demo, the show and tell. And what you ultimately are trying to answer is, what is it? <laughs> Why are you here? What do you, what do you got? You tell me the problem. What is it? And how does it work? A lot of entrepreneurs make a, a really big mistake here where they don't explain how it actually works. Uh, and we, at least I've left some presentations where I go, so is it a, is it a platform? Are you selling a license? Like, what, what is it that you're doing? What is, what is, what did you, what did you create? Uh, so make sure that you're very clear. And some people tend to explain it from the user's perspective. So for the natural nipple, she explains, you know, mother is giving, you know, gives birth, is in the hospital, and then, you know, is breastfeeding and gives kind of a quick story if you have the time. So an example is um, Refibrid. Refibrid is based out of California, but they go to Carnegie Mellon at the Schwartz Center. And they are early stage. So I'll show different examples. They're early stage. And this was a little bit because they don't, they're so early, they don't have a lot of products. So this is the way they got around this for those who are still early. You know, they just focused on this is the only 100 eco friendly textile recycling system that converts unsorted used textiles into new 100% recycled thread. And they add it's AI enabled, is robotic assisted, and it's 100 percent green chemical. So it's, it's, what are the attributes? You only want to say what's awesome about it. Okay. Only mention things where you're like, it's impressive. The parts that leave it to the judges, leave it to the VC, leave it to the customer to provide the skeptical, you know, to, to poke the holes. They also added, so there was just two slides in their solution, I believed, you know, what their advantages are. So why them? Because right? other people create eco-friendly, um, uh, systems and, and textile material. So they write down, they have a strong thread, um, which is made 100% from textile waste. It's 50% cheaper than cotton thread, 75% cheaper than other recycled thread, and 100% eco-friendly process, which preserves dye color, which is a problem uh, for those who are familiar with this. this. So here's an, a very easy example. It's not very complex and it gets to the point. For the natural nipple, this is how she explained it. There's three components to what she's doing. It's not just the, the bottle. It's also that there's a digital component. There's an app that actually tracks. And then there's also a, a, a data kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, there's like data test, I guess it says here, data testing, but it's like analyzation of the actual um, bottle feeding. So this is how she explained it. And it's three photos, you can, you can even get it from Pexels. It's very simple. Then to add to the solution in her, in her slide was the environmental impact. So it saves a hundred, you know, if we go through this, it will save 150 million containers of formula that end up in landfills. It improves outcomes and lower costs. It provides access to care. So it, it's not just about, this is how we do it, but this is the impact. This is how big this could be, all right? The next part that I mentioned in this section is, is a little bit of that traction. And this can look different for every person. So for her, she has a partnership with Johnson & Johnson, with J Labs. She's been to other competitions. She's raised money. She's done research. Not a lot of people add research hours, but she says 10,000 is a nice number. I'm going to add that. For you, you got to figure out what that is for you. What is, is it that you made you know, you had a thousand interviews with potential customers is that you've spoken with um, four hospitals in her case. So what is it that you want to include here that you've accomplished this thus far? Some people say pitch competitions that they've won. So you want to determine um, 
what you want to include here, but always make yourself look good because you are good. For Refibird, they're early, remember? So for them, this is what they chose. They're patent pending on a textile recycling process. They went through the accelerator at CMU and um, went through the NSF Corpse program. Uh, just to mention, Refibird won um, best bootstrapped company at South by. So that's why I'm providing them as an example. All right, next is the business. How are you all doing? Doing okay? Still tracking, all right. There's a quiz after this. I'm just kidding, I'm not, it's not. All right, next is the business. And this can look in different ways. Here you talk about the market. If you didn't already include it up top for natural nipples, she decided to do it from the very beginning. Um, others will put it in this section. So the market, your business model, your team, use of funds, timeline. Sometimes that last part, you may, may not want to include it. Usually some level of a timeline is important. But ultimately, someone who's watching this presentation is asking themselves this, is this a sustainable business idea? And that's what you should be answering in this section. And you do that by what these, these subsections that I just mentioned, right? And, and that looks into, yeah, pricing, market size, team, et cetera. So for Refibird, this is what their market slide was. Another simple one, what's the total market down to the total addressable market. Uh, for natural nipple, that's for our market. So you have two examples from our market. For the business model, this is the natural nipple one. This is who they will be selling it to. They already have the pricing down. You may or may not have the pricing down, but you might know who you're selling it to. So you would list, we are planning to sell to through um, direct to consumer, through um, B, B2B retailers, through hospitals, and um, they will order in this way. So maybe it's more of the process or the different ways you would generate revenue if you haven't figured out the price yet. Okay. Uh, next is, I'm, I'm adding the competition because it's an obligatory competition slide. If you have five minutes, leave this for the index. You don't need this because you're only gonna, we all know you're gonna make yourself look good. So, but just have it in your index. And, and the reason why it's important to have it is because as a judge, I wanna know that you know who else is in the market and that you have a competitive advantage. So on the left side is the usual attributes and you always wanna be the person who has all the check marks. So you essentially cherry pick and then you pick other um, competitors. Another way that I've seen this happen is this is a, a language learning software also part of the competition from, from last year. I think they're from New York and they do this grid of community focus and you always make your logo nice and big. In fact, some people make the other logos grayscale. You know, it's gonna look nice, right? But again, leave it for the end uh, when it's a five minute presentation. Sometimes if it's 10, you can fit in there. But here's an example of a timeline uh, particularly with this group, they didn't have a, a date. Sometimes you have a lot of, it's dependent on a lot of things. So you don't know when this is going to happen. So you can talk about what is your growth plan? What are your next steps? You're going to do pre-sale, initial pilots, you, you know, your go-to-market uh, and to scale. For a natural nipple, she was even kind of, she was more specific in timing, but less specific in what it was, at least on her slide perspective, but explained it verbally. So now they're doing the final prototyping of the product. Then in Q1, uh, this was a little bit earlier, but they're going to do beta testing uh, and then reimbursement in Q3 2021. So it can be as simple as that, but you want to add it. Uh, and we all know judges, VCs, like things never take as short of a time as you thought. Everything takes three times as long, but we wanna know where your mind is for your next steps. Lastly is uh, for this section is the team section. This is for Refibird and they talk, I think they could have done a better job, but there are mainly students. Some people, particularly for her, she's she has Intel experience and CMU, I would have added the logos on this slide because it's more visual, people recognize logos. So consider that, but it can be very simple and, and show some faces. You may, if, you're, if you have a really strong advisory board, uh, 
uh, or advisory, yeah, advisory board, particularly if your team might be inexperienced or don't have a lived in experience of the product or market you're entering, it would be a good idea to include them. I really liked how the natural nipple did it here because she actually broke it down to how they actually contribute to the growth of this company and has a lot of familiar logos. So something to consider, but this is if you have like a really dope advisory board. All right, lastly, oh, okay. I'm doing okay in timing. So we might have actually time. I'm speeding through. So lastly is the closing. Okay. We've gone through this journey. We've done the opener. We've done the demo. We've done the business. And now it's the closing. It can be an ask. It can be a tagline. It can be a lot of things. But you don't want to introduce a new idea, that a completely new idea, other than maybe it's Funding is what I'm looking for, and I'll give an example. But ultimately, what you're trying to ask or answer is, what do you want? Uh, you what do you want them to remember or feel at the end of this? What do you want them to do? You want them to sign up for you know updates? Do you want money from them? Do you want introduction, or do you want them to just remember? Uh, give them the this is the opportunity to give them the language that when they tell someone else about your business, they have that one liner. Okay. They know what to say because you want them to talk about you to others, right? And, and what the big sell, selling point is. For, for the natural nipple in this um, competition, she decided for one of the slides before the opener is to say what she's trying to raise. And she wrote down what it's for. You Typically, you don't just say, I want half a million dollars and just be silent. You want to talk about, well, where would that go to? Uh, and I think she did a, a good job here and she explained it a little bit more verbally. Um, but for Refiber, just kept it pretty simple, right? So thank you, logo, and then reminded you of the problem. Today, less than 1% of material used to produce clothing is recycled into new clothing, clogging landfills and representing a loss of more than $100 billion worth of materials each year. And Refibrid is the 21st century solution that will change the world. Look at that line, right? So that's their approach. Uh, and you can pretty much just copy, you know, copy this with whatever you're working on. Another example is even simpler. Molly Works was one of the winners also for South by. Uh, it was for Innovation World, I think. And they just said, join us to enable feats not yet imagined. That's a tagline right? And it's the contact information. That's how you really end it. So I know I sped through it. I have a few more things here, but in terms of the pitch presentation, pitch deck, this is kind of like a big overview. Uh, again, if we do this a longer engagement, I usually have a lot of embedded videos because it also goes into, it's not just the slides, it's your delivery of this information. Uh, and so maybe we'll do a longer one and, or maybe I'll link to some videos that I usually connect people to for good examples. But then sometimes for pitch competitions, VCs or whatever, there's always that Q&A. And we're gonna do this from the perspective of pitch presentations, oh, sorry, uh, pitch competitions. When you have a Q&A, you always wanna prep in advance. Get, use that index, okay? In fact, consider your index. You know, for you know, if you ever have like a shopping issue, right? Like a physical shopping issue. What some people sometimes recommend is that you go to the store you put everything in the shopping cart and then you don't buy it. I mean, don't actually do that because that's really mean to do to the people who work there. But you know what I'm trying to get that get at is that you sometimes you just need to you just need to touch it and put it in your cart, but don't actually buy it. So consider your index as a place of everything you really want to say about your product that should not be in your five minute presentation. If someone asks about it, you can always switch to it, but prep in advance. You always want to answer questions concisely. If there's a four minute uh, time span to um, four minute time span for questions, you don't want to spend two minutes answering one question. You want to keep it to 30 seconds. One, I mean, it has to be a really good answer if it's one minute, but like 20 to 30 seconds answer. You always want to be nice, okay? They, yes, you got a great product. But don't ever, don't argue. I've seen people argue with judges 
or it just gets tense that's it's unnecessary and it's distracting from your really great product that might be a great business for people to invest in buy or support in one way or another okay um and then and then lastly when it comes to the q a i always tell people never to bs it okay we know when you are bsing it we know when you're making an answer up or you don't know Last week when I was judging, I had asked this one founder a question she did not know the answer to and she answered it very well and I wrote it down. She said, that is an interesting question. We haven't done research on that, but it's a good question to note down. Alternatively, you can say, that's a great question. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, get back, I'll get back to you on it. Can I have your contact information? And that way you also have some contact information. But always just say, I don't know, we would like to find out or keep that in mind. Every question, if you have another team member or a friend or someone who's attending or even recorded um, voice, write down those questions and make sure next time you have the answer to that. Because if that person asked you that question, you're probably gonna get that again. So you want the answer to it, okay? Um, all right, so now the next thing is public speaking. All right, public speaking is not fun. Okay, I, during these presentations, I essentially black out and I ask Anya and Ben, was that any good? So, but you can make it happen, right? No one likes it, but you have to do it, all right? So first, what I encourage people do is again, write it out. That could be a bullet point, everything you wanna say about your presentation or everything you, you, know, you wanna talk about during your pitch, write it all out. Um, yeah, bullet points, it could be pros, whatever makes sense to you. And then you start to organize it into ideas and thoughts. Consider those five structures that I had mentioned. It was the opener, it was a show and tell. Oh, sorry, the four sections. Opener, show and tell, business, and the close. Anything that doesn't fit in there, you move it to the index. You wanna map it out, write it all out. And then once you've done all of that, you leave for a second, maybe a day, whatever. You come back to it. And then you cut 60% of what you just wrote, okay? Because I, you're really interested in what you're doing. I'm not that interested, okay? So I'm interested in, in give me the idea, all right? So try to cut 60, depending if you're very verbose, it might be 80, but cut it, okay? You always want to be focused on simplicity, specificity, and conciseness, your tone, your speed, and your confidence, okay? I don't know what you need for confidence. I, I, I don't. Sometimes people stand up, right? Some people listen to music. Some people go into the bathroom and just like talk to themselves and go, you got this, okay? Or you can do a Beyonce and just create a whole other stage persona and that's you when you pitch. But you have to figure something out because if you're not confident, you're not gonna sell, period, okay? Tone and speed is important because you want people to pay attention. If you're monotone, they're going to tune out. Okay. Uh, I, uh, you know, I speak pretty quickly because I'm trying to fill a lot of information here, but there are times where I pause and there are times where I raise my voice. There's times where, so you, you want that change to keep people paying attention. When it comes to your presentation, going back to it, your actual deck, you want to make sure it has it's simple and visual and bold, All right? You, uh, if you look earlier, I tried to keep as little amount of words as possible and make those words big. That's not how my slides started out. I had a lot on my slides, and then I moved most of it down to my notes section, and you keep it simple, visual, and bold. So an example I think Y Combinator likes to use is, is this one. So it's AfroStream describing themselves of, of what they do and what happens. So AfroStream is a subscription video on demand service which provides an unlimited access to African-American and Caribbean movies and TV series. <sighs> we bring a unique focus to content creation, distribution and engagement for the radically underserved black uh, and black friendly audiences. I mean, it's great if you, I guess if you say it aloud a little bit, but it's a lot and those words are hard to read. So instead consider something like this, AfroStream, Netflix of African and African-American content. Boom, you can explain everything else verbally. This is distracting. I'm not gonna read all of that. And you want me to read that while you're talking to me? It just is not gonna happen. But this is something that's some, that I can, 
describe someone else about AfriStream. Oh, AfriStream? Yeah, they're the Netflix of African and African-American content. So consider that as a barometer, as an example. All right. Oh, okay. So the last thing I kind of want to leave you with is uh, some links and resources. So just kind of go down. Techstars has a great pitch worksheet to help you work through. And uh, let me, once I stop sharing, I'm going to send these links via the chat. But uh, yeah, Techstars has a pitch worksheet. It's fabulous. And it breaks down some of the sections that I talked about and asks you the questions to help just get the words out on paper. Y Combinator has on Google Docs a, a, a seed deck. So if you're you know, a seed company, you can just use it for anything really, but it's bare bones. It's like white background, probably Calibri fonts, but you can start there. If you want something a little bit more graphic, you can use Canva and Slidebean. They have some great, I see a lot of entrepreneurs and pitch competitions more and more using Canva. Slidebean has great examples, even down to Uber and Airbnb. Uh, uh, Peloton as well. So they have some great examples to refer to. So I at least use it for that. It's free. Pexel's awesome for stock photos. You, it makes you look like you have a multi-million dollar fabric industry like Refibered. All those photos were from Pexels. Okay. Five minute pitch decks. South by Southwest posts the pitch decks of five minutes of all their finalists at South by watch it, check it out. You can Google it um, too. Refibrid is on there, Molly Works, which I gave an example. They got, they were the innovation world winner, but look at them. And I'll be honest, I didn't like all of them, but it's a good reference point. And like I said earlier, you're always gonna have a critic. It's never gonna be to everyone's liking. Jim Gibbs, he's on our board. He's great. He did a, he posted, had a whole Twitter thread sometime last week or a couple of weeks ago on investor pitching. What are his personal rules of investor pitching? I thought it was straight to the point and, and wonderful. Uh, and then lastly, look at each other's pitches. Attend pitch events. You can, Pitt has pitch events, CMU has pitch events. We have, you know, pitch events, Innovation Works. There are a lot of folks around town. And now that we're digital, you can also see global pitches. So, use this opportunity to take note. I take screenshots and of people's slide decks and, and use them for presentations <laughs> and also to reference to see what I liked and what made sense. So do that and also listen to the questions that, that those pitchers are, ask, are asked so that you know how you can prepare as well, whether through a slide deck or know how to answer something. And, and you always wanna call up your overly honest friends. Your mom is always going to think you're cute, unless you're my mom. Well, she thinks I'm cute. But, you know, you want the people who are going to tell you, I have no idea what you told me in the last five minutes. Or this slide does not make any sense. Or how are you going to make, ideally, someone with some experience in this, because they'll poke some holes. You want that, because you want to be prepared. And that's why if you're presenting or you're pitching, you don't want to pitch to a VC right away. You don't wanna to pitch to an angel investor right away. You wanna to pitch to friends. Maybe you even attend some pitch competitions and pitch there that are low stakes as practice. Think, consider yourself a comedian where you workshop some of your jokes to your friends and then you go to small you know, uh, comedy clubs and then you, know, you take the big Netflix stage with the worked out material. So that's what you wanna do with your pitch, whether it includes a slide deck or it doesn't. Uh, so that, those are kind of my suggestions. Um, and then I guess lastly is that you got this. All right. Thank you very much. I'm Nadili and we have some time. I zoomed by it. I think removing the videos examples helped, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll answer any questions. Let me make sure I, I stop presenting. Mm -mm -mm. Right, everybody, this is your time. Um, just feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question or you can also send it in the chat box and we'll read it out loud. Oh, there are a lot of, there are a lot of messages in there. Okay, let me, I'm putting in the links to the, to the, all the links that I just mentioned. Copy and paste them, very, very useful. All right, any questions? Hey guys, this is Mark. 
That was a great presentation. Really tremendous. What do you think is the biggest mistake people make? Uh, when it comes to pitching, yeah, they spend too much time talking about the product specs to the detail that is not, it's immaterial to me. So uh, Refiber did a good job in doing an overarching, this is, these are like the three or four really great components, but I've seen people start talking about the, the AI code and like, no, I just wanna know it works and that no one else is doing it. So that's one of the biggest mistakes because I end up not knowing about everything else because they spend time on the product. The last thing is the opener demo business closing. Is that the same format you would use for the venture capital pitch? So venture, uh, so when it comes to different customers, the order of these things often change of how, how you present information. So when it comes to a VC, you usually want to first mention the problem and then you want to talk about how big the market is dollar uh, and how big the market is. Usually I have a, I think I have a link. I went to this webinar about why VCs don't fund you. <laughs> and it was great because uh, they essentially want to make sure that your addressable market is in the billions of dollars. If you have less than that, they're usually not that interested. So, so you want to start from the very top because that's what they're curious about before they determine. And then you talk about your solution briefly and is it patent pending or you have a patent on it. Okay. Does that, that answer your question? Yes, it does. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Maya, did you, or is that how you pronounce it? Maya, Maya? <laughs> Sorry. I, I don't know why it's under my daughter's Zoom. Oh. <laughs> I didn't even look up at my screen until just now. Um, my name's Tim. And uh, I, okay, Tim. again, thanks for all the information. But I was just wondering um, how much of a difference um, with if you're if you're pitching a non uh, nonprofit, like if it's, can you just use the same basic layout for if you're pitching a nonprofit? So are you pitching a nonprofit in a pitch competition or are you talking to foundations? Um, I, I kind of in the mix of deciding which route to take the business in. And okay. was just, if there's like any major differences to be aware of as far as pitch wise. With, with so, so when it comes to nonprofits, oftentimes your customer is different than your user, right? Your customer is the foundation who's gonna give you the dollars and the users are those who benefit from the work that you do. And so if you're in a, um, a, if, if you're in a presenting to a foundation, then that's how you would frame it. How can you, how do you shore up that the dollars you're spending is actually creating an impact and how you will measure that impact more and more foundations are wanting to know, how do you know this actually is working? That is actually worth it. Um, if you're unsure, I would, I would not specify if you're a nonprofit or not, people might ask. Or you can say we're looking at two different business models, either through foundation support or a social enterprise. Because you might, if you're unsure, you might get some really great insight uh, from folks who are listening in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just wondering. Uh, you know, I guess with like uh, grants and stuff that are uh, you're eligible for if you are a nonprofit versus for profit. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just who you're serving is how you determine if if you're eligible. Some people are focused on economic development. RK Mellon, for example, uh, not only is economic development, but it's uh, mothers. And so if you're serving that demographic, you're hitting two. And so you want to spend time. It's like research, right? You want to spend time that specific foundation. I look up of what their uh, strategic goals are, and I use their same language and frame my whole presentation on how it matches their strategic goals Excellent. and how we're doing it differently and maybe better than other nonprofits or how we can partner with them. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay. Any other deal, yes. deal is Phil Brooks with OK to stand up. Um, great presentation. Um, one of the things that comes up an awful lot is people just need to have you send a deck first. They won't even, you know, set up the appointment unless you provide that. How do you modify your deck to make it deliverable without you? to still be as compelling? Any sort of key tips that you think about there? Yeah, that's a fabulous question. So what I would do is you can go two routes. I've seen what I, I've seen two routes where you do kind of over explain on the slide because 
at that point, this person's only reading the slide. It doesn't have you audibly talking as well. So you don't have that distraction. You don't wanna do a full narrative. I would just highlight more, um, you know, percent efficiency, you know, increases efficiency by 55%, increases blah, 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 for by 75% when it comes to your advantage. Uh, more, maybe some images about your product the glo I would say it's very similar, honestly, and you just want to make sure you're highlighting the numbers because, uh, again, you just want them to actually talk to you. If it's a VC, then you want to say, well, you definitely want to include uh, your kind of return on investment graph in that first um, uh, email to them with that pitch deck. You know, what, what are you expecting with revenue? break even, the return on the investment based on how much equity you're willing to give them. If it's negotiable, you can just pick a number. You just want to give them an idea that it's going to be, there's going to be a return on the investment in less than seven years. Uh, and then I would say if you can, there's a lot of ways, if you have a product that does something, there's a lot of ways that you can turn it into a GIF or a small video. So it gives someone an idea. Um, yes. So that's a hard one without, it's a hard one for me to answer without knowing your product. And I'm happy to talk to you afterward uh, to help you more with that. Thanks. We have a related question. Uh, I'm curious whether you think it's actually a good idea to share a pitch deck prior to presenting as opposed to just sharing, let's say, a one pager. Because I also attend lots of webinars and talks with entrepreneurs. And one of the don'ts from that experience is included entrepreneur sharing pitch deck with VC because they wanted it. And then VC canceling the event, canceling the meeting, and two months later seeing another team presenting very, very similar deck to his pitch deck. So do you have any comments on that? Basically their takeaway was to share pitch deck after presenting. That's that's very that's very unfortunate for that team. I don't know how often that really happens. Uh, I think what what a one pager and a pitch deck, if it's a hefty one pager, it's gonna include the same level of information as uh, as a short pitch deck that's gonna be less than 10 slides. Um, if someone is able to pitch a presentation and, and get that meeting, you didn't do a good job, just like point blank, right? So I, I'm not, a, personally, I'm not against with doing a small less than 10 slide pitch deck to a VC or an investor. Um, because a one pager would be the same. Okay, thank you. Greg, I think you have, you're muted. I'm muted. I guess you saw my lips moving. Um, the, uh, if you're sending a, um, a pitch deck to someone, is an alternative also to send a video of you giving the pitch? I, unless they ask about it, I wouldn't. Um, what some people also do is I've, I've seen different variations of this where they actually create a live um, hidden web page if they have a website hidden web page where it always updates with progress with revenue milestones and sometimes it even includes a video. Uh, and that way, if you send the pitch deck, you can say, you know, if you want additional information, you can have it here. But if it's the initial contact, I don't want them to go to the web page. I want them to talk to me because the thing is, you also want to understand what they're like, what their personality is like. Oftentimes, uh, there's one, there was one entrepreneur who doesn't use slides for a presentation. And what he does is that he just speaks because as he's paying attention to, are people interested in here or are they getting bored? He shifts his presentation audibly based on that. So I I would not do the video because it lets them do the judging without you. You know what I mean? So the answer is not right. Yeah. Well, I guess if you're going to do that, then you could just zoom with them and give your presentation, show it to them while you're talking to them. Right. Okay. Hi there. Uh, one quick question. I wanted to ask about customer acquisition and when you're doing these pitch decks. I'm assuming that goes into the appendix or depending on the stage of, of your company, where, where would that fall in and how much time would you recommend on customer acquisition? Yeah, so uh, a few things. It depends on where you are in your stage, right? So if you've already generated a lot of revenue and sales and you're showing some other finances, like 
I'm assuming you're doing it right. So I don't need it in the main component. If you're early, the question will always be asked, what is your plan for customer acquisition, particularly depending on your product where they think it might be tough. Uh, so again, it kind of depends on your product, but I would say maybe spending only one slide and maybe like 10, 15 seconds, if you have the room, if not, I would put it in the appendix. Cause usually if it's a concern, if, if it's, if you got a plan that is impressive and you got it, you should include it. But if it's, it's not that appendix, appendix. Got it, thank you. Great questions. Anything else? Hi there. Um, yeah. uh, I, I've heard that uh, in for some for some firms, you need to have three decks. So the kind of the casual deck, then the um, the financials deck, and then the super financials deck. What, what, what do you, you know, what do you think around having multiple decks? So when it comes, are you talking about firms like VC firms? I'm guessing yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> so, so usually, uh, I'm sorry, but it depends, but usually when you want the additional finances, it's, you're moving along the, the process. And so what you can add, it can be different. I've seen it done differently. You're right, it is good to have that. The pitch deck that we cover today is just the start. It's the start of the conversation. And then as people are wanting to either invest in you, they wanna do more due diligence and wanna get more into the financials. It is typically unlikely, or at least the, the investors that I've worked with from the very first meeting, they don't need total in-depth uh, until the second meeting. So you might wanna have it on deck but it's not what you would start it. But but yes, you want to have some information on the finances, particularly when it comes to VCs. Could I ask um, this very basic question? When you mention the appendix um, and you're not presenting it, um, is that for the purpose of sending them the pitch deck after you're done presenting it and they can then read through the appendix? Or what is the point of it? The point of the appendix is so that when someone asks you a question, well, they'll say, a good example like let's say you're in manufacturing and it's you know a, a product that is it's a it's a solution that is within like a whole factory system try explaining that to someone without visuals <laughs> so so the purpose is is so when you have a question that might be easier to explain via visuals it also takes less time when you have visuals and if you have a time constraint then you just switch to it and say well actually here this is an opportunity where you include cash flow, try to explain cash flow, you know, audibly only, um, how something works or a plan. So that, that's the purpose. I wouldn't typically include it because it's usually a lot. When I send it out, I would just include the first, the first part. If they have additional questions, I just say, if you have additional questions about whatever, let me know. Yeah. Great, thank you. Well, it's 5 p.m. If there are no one more question, then, you know, this is it for today. Thank you very much to everybody who attended. Thank you, Nadili, for providing so many great insights and like really a holistic view of how do you prepare for a pitch. And, uh, and I'll see you next time for our upcoming events.